what's good y'all welcome back today we are finishing up three before february i hope you guys have been enjoying the reactions this week uh a lot of downs a lot of downs this week for um this little series i'm doing but last episode it was ended kind of on like a higher note they started implementing more safety features to help the, the drivers and the cars uh so let's see if it ends fully on a good note hope you guys have been enjoying the reactions original video link will be down in the description let's get into the video similar incidents two young stars gone questions are raised we know what we need to do my answer to that is strap your butt in there at 220 mile an hour in a straightaway and have something go wrong hit the wall head on and tell me if you'd like to have some cushion down there well i tell you i would Softball yeah i saw this one used in other mm, tested, fuck without closure just hearing Kill that sounds terrible stalled. Various safety measures tried, but once again the monster raises its ugly head, an announcement is made. We know how to slow cars down. We, we've done it uh, at Daytona and Talladega for the same reason, where the cars became too fast for the track. But? Uh, and we know how to do that, and we do that with restrictor plates. Okay. The threaded plate is bolted on, opinions fly. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how to work. I think that's a good idea. If you hit the wall at 160 or 180 me. You know, it don't matter. Let's go up here and go race and see what happens. Engine builders spring into action and burn the midnight oil in the push to squeeze research, development, and production into a scant few days. Yeah, we know we have to build something kind of in between what we've always built, so we just kind of, I mean, you have no time to do it, so it's pretty much a stab in the dark. So many questions, so much at stake. 43 teams are poised to enter the unknown. The Cup Series races at Loudon this weekend, Kyle. I'm sure people would like to know your thoughts on that track and the safety issues that have come up about it. Yeah, you know, and, and I've probably thought as much or more than a lot of people have <laughs> on the issue. Um, I don't blame Loudon at all at the racetrack. Uh, the Bears are some of the greatest people in the world, as you know, and anybody that's ever dealt with them. Um, you know, and, and, and talking to Bob, he had an incredibly hard time. He and I had a good conversation right after it happened, uh, and they're just great people. But, you know, is the racetrack dangerous? Tough question. Um, they run 10 million miles there and nothing ever happened, you know? And all of a sudden, you have two wrecks, um, you know, within a short period of time, so everybody's mm -hmm. up in arms. Can yeah. we be safer? Yeah. Can the racetracks be safer? Yes. yes. September 15th, the Winston Cup Series is back in New Hampshire for opening practice. Tony Stewart wears a helmet painted like Irwin's and seeks a season sweep at the track. Jack Roush reports his Cup Series drivers will carry his automatic dumb switch that was tested at Richmond. Joining them will be Ricky Rudd, Bobby Labonte, Tony Stewart, and Elliot Sadler. Roush has 14 more of the switches available for the 35 remaining drivers entered in the race. By October 1st, he'll have enough for a full 43-car field. The opening practice comes and goes without serious incident. Bobby Labonte wins the pole. Steve Grissom just misses the cut in Kyle Petty's car. Ted Musgrave qualifies 11th with what was once Kenny Irwin's team, matching Irwin's own season-best start at Dover. In the wake of two fatal accidents here, last week NASCAR mandated the use of restrictor plates to slow the cars down. Restrictor plates had never been used on Winston Cup cars at New Hampshire or even a track like this, and that has opened wide the gates of the great unknown. Teams have struggled with engine combinations, chassis setups, transmissions, and gear choices. Engines are down 300 horsepower. As a result, fuel mileage is up. Some teams can go 25 laps further than ever before. Some adapted Daytona engines to here. Others adapted unrestricted engines to a plate. Everyone is running a combination they never ran before. Talk in the garage today is that the race could go to someone experienced and successful in cars with less power. NASCAR Bush Series cars, someone like Mark Martin. The advantage could go to those who have expended extraordinary effort, like Steve Park and Jeff Burton, who tested at a similar track in Milwaukee. All hope that their car will be fastest, but mostly all hope that the race will be safe. Just let them race safe. On Sunday, defending race winner Joe Nimichek climbs from 30th to 9th. John Andretti starts 31st and finishes 7th. But outside pole sitter Jeff Burton leads all 300 laps and wins under caution, NASCAR's first flag-to-flag -flag performance since 1978. 
Curiously, Burton is actually the most outspoken driver on the subject of safety and faces stiff opposition from his fellow competitors. And I was hearing a lot of things that I just did, did plain and simple disagreed with. And I thought that it needed to be said. And um, it wasn't acceptable to lose Adam Petty. It wasn't acceptable to lose, you know, anybody. That wasn't acceptable. And it didn't, it wasn't okay to just say that's part of the sport and it wasn't okay to say mm -hmm. well they're young and not big enough and uh, they like, know that's no. crazy in the end no one not even the winner of the race leaves new hampshire happy but everyone feels like they've dodged a bullet there's the names barfield martin shepherd yeah morgan shepherd missed the race again you can see it it's averaged 11 drivers per race for the last five events now 55 guys have gone home Five days after the New Hampshire race, Tony Roper fails to qualify for the Truck Series race at Dover, one of 11 drivers set home. His next attempt will be in three weeks at Texas. The O'Reilly 400 is the next-to-last race on the truck schedule, where Greg Biffle carries a 290-point lead over Mike Wallace for the championship. Roper qualifies 15th in the field, while eight drivers are sent home, including Morgan Shepard and Carl Long. On lap two, Roper misses a 10-truck pileup on the backstretch. On lap 26, well, he's in 17th, 18 seconds back of the Doesn't lead and closing on a pack of trucks. That is Tony Roper in the Mittler Brothers truck, and it is torn up. Now there's flames coming out of the underneath side, and the window Where? is not down. That is the signal to officials that he is okay. Meanwhile, the other truck in not okay? for sure was the 43 of Steve Grissom. There may have been one other one. You can see parts all over that the car. didn't look that bad. Our second caution of this race. Mike Mittler, whose pit stall is directly across from the accident scene, doesn't think the wreck is too bad. But Dean Roper, spotting for his son from the tower overlooking the track, doesn't hear Tony over the radio. He joins the family in rushing to the hospital. Emergency crews end up cutting a hole in the roof and lifting Roper out on a backboard. He's transported by ambulance out of the track. By the time he reaches Parkland Hospital, it's clear how serious the injury is. The impact has broken his neck and stopped the flow of blood to his brain. He's Jesus. breathing with the help of a respirator. The weekend in racing began with tragedy. NASCAR Truck Series driver Tony Roper suffered fatal injuries during Friday's O'Reilly 400 in Fort Worth after a head-on crash into the wall at Texas Motor Speedway. Roper was trying to maneuver through traffic when he touched another truck and lost control on the 32nd lap of the event. He passed away on Saturday, the first fatality in the three-and-a-half-year history didn't even look of the that track. Bad. At 11.55 a.m. the next day, Roper dies at age 35. While not a basilar skull fracture, as in Petty and Irwin, the impact is similar in speed and angle, and the injury is similar to Scott Baker's fatal injury at the ARCA race at Toledo back in June. Roper's death is another shock of reality to the NASCAR community. A third different driver is killed from a head-on impact with the outside wall. This time, it's not at New Hampshire, and not during practice. The issue is now clearly more than a track with a treacherous turn. It is something that could it's happen anywhere, at any time, to any driver. While this makes Roper's death perhaps the most critical of the three, it is nevertheless overlooked. Because the very next day, this happens. Three Chevrolet on the final lap at Talladega. 2.7 million and a million dollar bonus for Dale Earnhardt if he can hang on. The no ball five contender, Mr. Mr. And will take his tip to victory at Talladega. Three days after Earnhardt's win, Tony Roper's memorial service is held in the gymnasium at the Fairgrove High School, where Roper graduated in 1983. More than 600 people attend. In the days that follow, Roper's website receives more than 1,600 messages and emails, so many that the webmaster has to start a So much love and support. Board. He wasn't ever going to make cup, and he had resigned himself to that, says Tony's uncle Dale Roper. But like movie stars, very few make it at the very top level. But you can still make a very good living by being a supporting actor. His racing families, past and present, converged on his hometown of Fairgrove, Missouri, to say goodbye. In all, over 3,000 people paid their respects. Tony Roper was well-liked, and he was well-remembered. At the funeral, his wife Michelle bravely addressed us and reminded, Tony always saw the best in everything, and Tony Roper loved everyone. Thanks, Tony, for sharing your life with so many of us.
A week after Roper's accident, the Bush Series Ladies Association distributes decals in memory of Roper that run on the Bush Series cars at Rockingham, then again for the Truck Series finale at Fontana. The Mittler team doesn't run that week and returns for the 2001 season opener at Daytona. Larry Gunselman debuts the new truck number, 63. In this race and in each one for the next 17 years, every one of Mittler's trucks will carry Roper's name. There is no doubt in my mind that he would have been a superstar as a crew chief, says Mittler. He had the knowledge and the work ethic. On October 22nd, Kyle and Patty Petty found the Victory Junction Gang Camp. It's the seventh in an international network of hole-in-the-wall camps, which serve children with life-threatening illnesses. Located in Level Cross on property donated by Richard and Linda Petty, the completed facility features a large building that resembles Adam's colorful spree car. That's the next dope. day, Tony Roper is laid to rest in Fairgrove. By season's end, Kyle makes two more cup attempts, this time at Adams number 45. He makes the show at Martinsville and finishes 31st, then misses the field at Homestead. Both times, he runs the Pontiac that was brought to Charlotte, leaving Adams Chevrolet in the shop. Kyle's next attempt will be in a Dodge for the 2001 Daytona 500. Also among the Dodges will be a rookie, Jason Leffler in the Chip Ganassi number 01. With Bell South merged into tech firm Singular, the team Leffler will drive for will be completely unrecognizable from the one Irwin drove just seven months earlier. Over the offseason, NASCAR makes no new mandates regarding driver safety. While the stuck throttle issue has been addressed without being acknowledged, the rise in basilar skull fractures has not. On January 13, 2001, during preseason testing at Daytona, others take the initiative. A consultant speaks to Ford drivers, suggesting changes to their seatbelt systems in the Hans device, even offering to pay the bill for any driver wanting to order a Hans. Among the few who pick up this offer are Ricky Craven and rookie Andy Houston, now teammates at PPI Motorsports. Ford also holds a meeting with Dr. Robert Hubbard, the professor of biomedical design research who is part of developing the Hans. He states that both Adam Petty and Kenny Irwin Jr. could have survived their accidents if they used his device. Despite these rumblings, NASCAR is still reluctant to mandate the Hans, and Mike Helton states he doesn't plan on making a decision for a few weeks. We are not in a position today to make any changes, he says on January 30th. We just haven't seen anything yet that's not got something with it that gives us concern. Larry Woody, a veteran writer for the Tennessean, expresses his frustration over a lack of response by NASCAR. All the talk and attention that swirled around the issue of NASCAR safety last year seems to have cooled, unfortunately. It shouldn't take another racetrack tragedy to refocus attention on the matter. Efforts shouldn't lag in trying to find ways to build safer track walls, reliable ways to prevent stuck throttles, dependable helmets and harnesses. What were sizzling issues in the wake of last year's driver fatalities seems to have been all but forgotten amid the excitement swirling around the start of a new season and the attendant Daytona 500 dazzle. Woody's article goes to print on February 6, 2001, just 12 days before the 43rd Daytona 500. It falls on deaf ears. This is undoubtedly one of the toughest announcements that I've ever personally had to make. I know what's coming. Uh, but after the accident and turn four at the end of the Daytona 500, uh, we've lost Dale Earnhardt. Over the last two decades, NASCAR has advanced the narrative that <sighs> today's push for safety began with these words. An unthinkable tragedy followed by unprecedented action, creating a sport made better by lessons learned and measures taken. The Hans device, safer barriers, the car of tomorrow. Earnhardt's legend is allowed for this. When we lost the Intimidator, the tragedy was already so massive in scale. A larger-than-life driver dying in the sport's biggest race from a seemingly ordinary accident. But the more we've replayed it in our collective memory, it's grown impossible. This shit larger. don't sit right with it's me. It's now treated as though free from context, separate and apart from the three clear warnings that came before it. To this day, NASCAR continues to have a hard time dealing with the harshest realities of its sport. At the NASCAR Hall of Fame, the only monument to the 82 drivers who have died at NASCAR's sanctioned competition is a copy of the Earnhardt Report under glass. One volume open to the first page, its statement of facts laying out nothing more than the story we already know. It's as if no other driver had ever died in all of NASCAR history. But to deny history this way is to be doomed to repeat it. And oh, that yeah. is what happened on February 18th, 2001. It happened again on October 4th. Blaze Alexander, once a development driver for Team Sabco, Ooh. collides with Kerry Earnhardt while battling Fuck. for the lead at Charlotte. 
Alexander slams the wall nearly head-on, practically identical to the crash that killed Tony Roper less than a year earlier. It's just as identical in outcome. Alexander dies at 25. Wow. While death happens in Arca, it is this accident, and not the four before it, that finally convinces NASCAR to mandate the Hans device. That should have been meant, bruh. I have a picture hanging up in my office. It shows Robert Yates putting on the 28 jacket on Kenny. I knew <clears throat> that all the work and all the sacrifices we had made, um, everything was paid in full. Just right there on that, on that moment. And it was the great experience of my life. It wasn't a race that he'd won or a qualifying that he'd set down or anything else. It was just watching Robert Yates put that 28 jacket on Kenny. After Kenny Irwin Jr.'s death, his parents discovered how philanthropic he was in life. Families tell them how he had paid hospital bills and sent their children to camp. A friend recalls Irwin giving an old man his expensive sunglasses just because he had sun in his eyes. Irwin's efforts inspired his parents to start a camp for underprivileged children. As part of their Kenny Irwin Jr. Foundation, they rebuilt an old campground in Newcastle, Indiana. The Dare to Dream camp runs for seven years before the Irwins' decline, declining health forces them to sell in 2011. The foundation lives on today. What do you remember the most? His enthusiasm, um, everything. His desire, his smile, his touch, everything. Kyle Petty continues to drive Adams 45 and Cup until Petty Enterprises closed its doors in 2008 and retired from competition. Kyle and wife Patty divorced in 2012. Three years later, Kyle uh, marries Morgan Castano. Morgan gives birth to Kyle's fourth child, Overton, in 2018. As part of the 15th anniversary of Victory Junction in 2019, Bubba Wallace runs an Adam Petty throwback scheme at Darlington. The throw looks like this. Todd Kuhn in the Chevrolet, the 20, and the great veteran Dean Roper from Missouri and the Mueller Brothers, 89. On August 19, 2001, Dean Roper races on, his, on in his son's memory. He starts in 12th ARCA race at Springfield at age 62. 62! He died of a heart attack on lap 17? Bro, what? What the fuck? At Eldora in 2015, Bobby Pierce gives Mike Midler his only top five finish. Midler passes away in 2019. His number 63 team is currently owned by DJ Cop. Cope? A scholarship fund is founded in Tony's memory. That's that. The second one blows my fucking what? This was a interesting ass documentary. None of them forgotten. Wow. The Hans device should have been mandatory from day one as soon as they came out with that bitch. As soon as they came out with the idea for, for them to like have that because it can save their life, it should have been mandatory. I don't know why they didn't make it mandatory. Kind of irritates me, not going to lie. But you live and you learn. Um, and I guess, I guess just some people just have to learn the hard way, sadly. But I hope you guys enjoyed the reaction. I surely enjoyed the documentary. Uh, and I'm really, I'm, I'm, the whole history behind NASCAR just blows my fucking mind. It blows my mind. Cause I didn't know that all of this like happened, like in such detail, I didn't know all this happened right before Dale died. So knowing all of this happened right before Dale died, it's like, bro, 
what, what's going on? I hope y'all enjoyed the reaction. Like, comment, subscribe. And I'll see y'all next video. I love y'all. Peace. They wanna fall. What? Back when I was down bad, I was stuck in the mud. That nigga didn't clean up Louis V on the so so.